and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole, and this week we're examining what a second pandemic summer will mean for the trillion-dollar travel and tourism industry. Could vaccine passports be the answer to allow Europe's holiday hotspots to open up once again? And if we can travel, will tourism be the same? We'll find out Greece's plans for future visiting. And up, up and away is now the right time to launch a new airline. We'll meet the man who thinks it is. In 2019, more than one and a half billion people travelled across the globe, consolidating a 10-year record where tourism growth outpaced that of the global economy as a whole. Domestic tourism sectors generated one and a half trillion dollars in exports and provided one in ten people worldwide with a job. And then, of course, came the COVID pandemic and with it, lockdowns and travel restrictions, bringing international tourism to a standstill, dropping by almost three quarters in 2020. The industry lost an estimated $1.3 trillion in export revenue last year, more than 11 times the recorded loss during the 2009 global economic crisis. Half of the countries worst affected by the collapse in tourism are in Europe. Spain saw the lowest number of annual visitors in half a century. For France, the world's most visited country, travel restrictions and cancelled trips cost more than $70 billion. And Covid has left Greece, the European country most reliant on tourism, on its knees, with officials now saying they'll open their arms and doors to travellers from countries with strong vaccination programmes. While there's no doubt aviation is also suffering the worst crisis in its history, hotels and cruises were also devastated, which means an increase in road journeys and staycations. So how can the sector get the world back on the move? Well, thanks to the rollout of vaccines, there is hope for holidays on the horizon. Tourists in countries like Poland, Italy and Austria, closely followed by Germany, are all planning their new normal holidays. Outside of Europe, Chinese tourists are showing the strongest enthusiasm for taking a break. But the return to mass tourism won't happen quickly. The head of the World Travel and Tourism Council says the industry can't wait any longer, though, with up to 200 million jobs at risk if restrictions aren't relaxed by the summer. And the big problem is that no one can predict the journey that the pandemic will take us on this summer because Covid is still firmly in charge. Well, to try to give us an idea of what this summer might be like in Europe, I'm joined now from Brussels by Eduardo Santander, Chief Executive of the European Travel Commission. Eduardo, we're approaching the holiday season in the UK and Europe. How optimistic are you about returning to some kind of travel and tourist normality? Uh, well, we are pretty optimistic. We, we think that um, the summer will bring some normality to our lives and uh, that we will be able to travel. So with some restrictions, uh, we, we have to really think that this is uh, not the end of the pandemic yet and that we have to be very careful. But uh, for the travel and tourism industry, the summer is the restart um, of our business, is the restart of this sector, which has been suffering so much in the last 18 months. Are some businesses in the tourism sectors better prepared? We have learned a lot of lessons uh, from last summer, 2020, uh, where a lot of wrong things happened. And we, I think we all lower our guards to too early, in my opinion. And now what we see is that uh, the industry is preparing itself with a lot of uh, protocols, but also a lot of uh, measures put in place by local and uh, national authorities. What we see is that um, the subsector of mobility, meaning aviation, ground transportation, and many others, uh, as well as accommodation, for instance, are pretty ready to go. So they, they have been repeating that for, for weeks, if not months already, that they, they are, it's pretty safe to travel. It's not um, the, the act of traveling which makes, uh, makes it dangerous or, you know, like it, it is the behavior at departure or destination. So what we see here, it's maybe that the small and medium-sized enterprise, and don't forget that the, the European entre entrepreneurship is made up to 85% of small and medium-sized enterprises. Those are the ones that still need a lot of support, help from uh, the governments, uh, from the European Commission, from their own... Uh, are they getting that support? 
They are, they are. The support is coming now and it's coming with a really um, urgency from, from their government as uh, from many countries, for many countries in the, in, in the European Union and beyond, also for UK. Um, the summary is so crucial for them, you know, to, to survive. I mean, we're talking about um, a survival threat for many, 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 many um, tourism enterprises, especially the small ones. I guess the, the, the big uh, corporations, the big uh, um, companies, uh, knew from the beginning that they had to have a new setup and, and they got their own resources and also a lot of state aid, you know, to do so. But the small and medium-sized enterprise is going to be here crucial for a, um, for a real recovery of tourism. And, 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 of course, many will have suffered very badly and will have gone to the wall, probably, uh, during the summer. And Britons have a love affair with Europe um, and love to travel there and go to Europe in huge numbers. But also China is a big... Um, tourist market uh, and America. How will you persuade the Chinese and the Americans to come to Europe uh, and persuade them that it's safe to do so? It is indeed going to be possible. I mean, the question in when it's difficult to answer right now, I don't have a date, but we are pretty convinced that, uh, you know, uh, long haul uh, markets, uh, you mentioned two of them, US and China, uh, will be coming back um, to Europe by mid or late summer. What we foresee here is actually an extended summer season. So we see a summer that's going to last practically until end of October or November. With a lot of these markets coming later in the year, the European Union has announced the digital green certificate. Uh, some people call it a vaccination passport, but it's not a passport. And it is not um, what, what a is it, certificate then? that... Well, it is uh, a proof of vaccination, a proof of a negative uh, COVID test, and a proof of immunization, which is uh, none of them is going to be a condition, a condition to enter any of the countries of the European Union. Meaning, if you're not vaccinated, you still can come to Europe, but you will be uh, subjected to some some other uh, conditions. I think this tool is really, really the hope that we have. I it's the only we, hope, digital... isn't it? Because I mean, Europe is divided. Some countries are ahead of others in their vaccination programs. Uh, Greece says it's ready to receive some uh, British tourists. Portugal, Croatia, Iceland, they're all better prepared. But there doesn't seem to be any unified tourism purpose or message to the world come to Europe yet. Well, I would not say they are better prepared. I would say they've been faster vaccinating their populations. The vast majority of the governments in, in, within the European Union will be ready by the beginning of the summer with 60 to 70 percent of their co um, um, populations already being vaccinated meaning that by the summer we all be at the same place uh, is it fair to say the pandemic has acted as a sort of wake-up call for some european countries in terms of their over reliance on tourism and in fact oh, yeah. this is a wake-up call because they're worried about mass the effects of mass tourism so, in fact, the message should be for more quality tourism. It, that's very true. Let's, um, Stephen, you know, one of the um, very uncomfortable uh, truths about tourism is that uh, it was a very um, margin revenue driven and very successful one um, business. Um, meaning that, and with an exponential growth that no other industry have seen in the last three decades. And, Nothing could stop this except in something like this. And we had um, the symptoms already of over tourism or, you know, places really suffering from, um, you know, the uh, consequences of having uh, too many visitors and so on, you know, problems with local communities and visitors and so on. I think this period of, of uh, pandemic time, you know, has given us the possibility, you know, to have a, a very deep reflection of what tourism should be in the future. And definitely should be not only more resilient, but it has to be much more sustainable, has to be much more digital. And I think that uh, the act of traveling is, will become um, a less automatic process in, in our heads, but as something much more reflected. And more considered, exactly. Eduardo Santander, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. You are very welcome. In 2019, Greece welcomed more than 30 million tourists, and that's three times the country's population, contributing a full quarter of the country's GDP. And one of Europe's weaker economies simply can't afford to miss out on that kind of income. So how is the country planning to cope with what looks set to be another 
difficult summer. Joining me now is Angela Garakou, president of the Greek National Tourist Organization. Uh, Angela, what's been the impact of COVID on Greek tourism? Of course, all we know, the year 2020 has been the worst year in the history of world tourism, the sector of Greek tourism. Uh, think about it because uh, for, Gre for Greece, we are dependent from tourism 30% of GDP. Uh, so you can imagine how damage uh, we had from this uh, pandemic. But in the same time, we are preparing with all our efforts, efforts to, to open again as soon as possible. And we have our weapons for that. We have the green certification that we are preparing now with Europe. Uh, the vaccines, we have the PCR, we have uh, everything we need as protocols uh, just to make our visitors to be feel safe and for our uh, citizens as well. So uh, even the, the, our Greek uh, national organization is preparing a huge campaign based on a different kind of model of tourism because we see the crisis as an opportunity as well to change the model of our tourism. Well, of that's, course, that is very, very interesting because I wondered, because the tourists had to stay away for a while, and has COVID, has the pandemic offered you, the country and the tourist board, a chance to think again about how you want to present the country and what kind of tourism yes. you want in the future? Yes. So it was like an accelerator, COVID, for us, to remind us what we have to do, we have uh, our beautiful sea and beautiful sun and the light hearts we know, but it's not enough. I'm talking about sustainability. I'm talking about green destinations. Our goal is 2030, as you know, and all Europeans and the American goals as well, we want, we, we wish to be, and we are working on this, to be, why not, a um, global center of culture and sustainable destination as country. We have to work for this very hard. We have to have strategies, specific strate strategies to education. We have to collaborate with very, very uh, known and powerful organization. Greece is ready. It's ready to welcome the world's tourists yes. back again. Yes. When I arrive, what will be different about Greece when I arrive? And talk me through from passport control. First of all, we care about your uh, sa safety, OK? Safeness. So pass control, uh, you have to see if you, are, you have the vaccine. How will okay? I prove that I've had the vaccine? With a certificate, the green passport, the certificate that the European Union now, and, and not, all, not only, all countries of Europe, I mean, uh, they are prepared to be ready about this. And then if you don't uh, have the certificate for vaccine, you must have the certificate of uh, PCR, uh, 72 hours maximum before you travel. And uh, then if you already passed the COVID and you have the antisomes, you have to prove with another test before you travel that you have so one of three of, of those three uh, you have three opportunities to travel. And Greece was one of the earliest countries to welcome back tourism. So what lessons can other countries learn from Greece? Our strategic uh, and the preparation to be safe as much as possible. I know it's not easy this year because already we have this lockdown, we have the pandemic and the measures. I mean, they are, uh, they're not quite as we want, but every day is a little bit better. So we have all these tools that we, we can uh, use to, uh, to have this uh, kind of uh, uh, security, you know, and safety. So we have to be care. Every country has to be very focused first of health, but then you have to, to make their, our visitors to feel that they're not coming in a, in a, in a huge hospital. They're coming here <laughs> to have, yes, they're, they're coming here. They have their vacation, their unique experience. They have to uh, meet all these 
color and phylloxenia we have here in hospitality, you know. So it's a, it's, it's a challenge for us to give this uh, happiness and this magic of tourism, you know, we, we must maintain this and at the same time make them feel secure. Angela Garaku, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, have global governments done enough to help hotels survive? We'll be asking the international hotelier, Sir Rocco Forte. Welcome back to the agenda. Restrictions on leisure and business travel meant that there was a slump in accommodation activity of more than 50% in the EU and the UK. The situation wiped out more than $138 billion in turnover and ended a decade of growth. But is there now room for optimism in the hospitality industry? I'm joined by Sir Rocco Forte, chairman of the luxury chain Rocco Forte Hotels. Um, so, Rocco, how would you describe the impact of COVID on the hotel industry? A complete and utter disaster. Um, uh, it's, I mean, in my, in my, for my company, for example, our sales will be 12% of what they normally are. So, uh, you know, it's devastating. And, uh, and um, many people in, in my industry have, have faced a similar situation. Uh, because across uh, most of continental Europe, uh, there's been a sort of stop-go. Uh, there have been periods of, of opening, uh, but there have been severe restrictions most of the time. So hotels haven't been able to function, and neither have restaurants and bars. Uh, in Italy, for example, at the present time, restaurant and bars are closed, uh, and uh, restaurateurs in Rome are demonstrating every day outside of the Houses of Parliament to be allowed to start earning a living again. Uh, so it's, a, it's been a very, very difficult situation, and many people have not survived this. Do you think the governments in Europe and the British government too has done enough to support the hospitality sector? Well, it's, it's varied uh, uh, across different, different countries. Uh, I don't think enough has been done, actually. In, in, in Britain, uh, for example, we've had the furlough scheme, which obviously helps, but that's more helpful to the people employed than the employers themselves. There's still a cost to the, to the employer. In Germany, the government is now um, uh, giving uh, direct grants to cover uh, people's overhead costs uh, uh, for over a six-month period, which, which comes... Uh, which starts from November of last year through to to June, uh, the end of June of this year, uh, and they they will be substantial. I mean, my company, I have three hotels in in Germany. We will be receiving uh, 12 million euros under this under this scheme, as well as furlough. In Italy, uh, the the situation tends to change all the time, uh, but there has been more direct help. There's been uh, where uh, where people are paying rents. 60% of the rents can op be offset against past or future taxes. But, I mean, generally, it, it's meant uh, using up one's own uh, existing financial resources and securing, securing uh, a lot more to, uh, take, to take us through. It's also changed um, the market for business travel, as many companies decide to cut back on corporate business travel. How will you, as a hotelier, uh, pull back or uh, attract... Uh, not just guests, but corporate guests to your hotels? Well, we've got a lot of uh, corporate um, group bookings uh, from uh, starting in August right through, through from, from then on. Be companies uh, holding group meetings and, uh, and incentives. And obviously, companies uh, have seen their travel bills cut considerably. Uh, and therefore will try and, uh, and maintain them at a, at a lower level going forward. After the financial crisis, we saw, um, we saw a big drop in, uh, in corporate travel, and it took two years for it to return to its normal levels. But I don't think it'll be quite 
as bad as that uh, going forward now. The other thing about uh, working, uh, so-called working from home or remotely, people can uh, have now got used to being able to work with their laptop and then they can easily go on holiday and work <laughs> from holiday. So by taking their laptop with me, with them. You've been in the business a very long time. Have you ever seen anything like this year before? No, because I've never, I've never imagined uh, a, a situation which, which my business would have no income. And uh, what the politicians don't seem to understand is that if you, if you don't have an income, you can't survive. Uh, and, and, and I find it very frustrating. Is this a chance also, perhaps, for hoteliers, uh, restaurateurs, to take stock, to sit back and think, OK, we're going to change the way we present our business? I mean, what we've done in my company is looked at how we uh, um, are selling and marketing uh, organisations work. And I think, as a result, uh, we'll come out of this with a much more efficient operation uh, and hopefully which will, which will uh, be able to boost our sales as the recovery uh, as the recovery starts. We've also learned to become more flexible. I mean hotels have had to open and close at fairly short notice um, and so they've got quite practiced in, in dealing with these situ situations. So I think in, in, in future they'll be able to adjust better to trough periods uh, and, and the seasonal trends that, uh, that hotels will normally face. Sir Rocco Forte, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you very much indeed. A lack of tourists and restrictions on travel have been devastating for the airline industry. It's estimated airlines lost $126 billion last year and will lose another $50 billion this year. But I'm going to talk to a man now who is an optimist. He hopes the future is rosier and more profitable. Bjorn Tor Larsen is the CEO of a brand new airline, Norse Atlantic Airways. Bjorn, out of crisis comes opportunity, I suppose. Um, not the best of time to launch an airline, is it? We believe that once the pandemic is behind us, people would like to travel more than they did in the past. And, and uh, in this environment, we have been able to secure very uh, competitively priced aircraft and we have been able to build a, a very strong and lean uh, organization uh, that uh, will be fit for purpose and we have the flexibility to uh, to start our operations when we see the, uh, the the light at the end of the tunnel. We also think that business travel will eventually be, uh, if not back to where it was, so we, we think it, it will come back because uh, uh, particularly for the long-haul flights, uh, uh, people still need to go and see their uh, their business associates and, and, and relations. So, uh, in sum, we uh, we think uh, the long haul market will be back. How much have you been influenced by the failure of the Norwegian Air Shuttle? I suppose you might have got some of its aircraft, but uh, uh, I mean, was that a lesson in how not to run an airline, or was it just all bad timing? I think it's probably a combination, but uh, we, we, our model is very different than, uh, than uh, what they had. We are a focused, long cost, uh, low. They had uh, a few incidents of bad luck, for example, with the engines, also with the Max and, and ultimately with the COVID. But uh, uh, our model is very different. We start off, we are debt free. Uh, we have very competitive leasing uh, terms for the aircraft uh, and we have a very flexible model. So uh, we can uh, manage to uh, make money at uh, a much lower yield than, uh, than the previous uh, contender had. We believe uh, in a few years' time there, uh, there will be a shortage of pilots again because uh, uh, we believe the, 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 the sort of overall flight activity will increase again up to the to levels we uh, had pre-COVID and, and maybe beyond that. How will NAA be different to any other airline? Uh, I mean, it, obviously, price will be the main reason. But what else? What will make you stand out from the rest, do you think? We have, uh, uh, you know, the, the very fuel-efficient and more environmentally-friendly aircraft than the average uh, operator. Uh, and even if we are a low-cost airline, we have no uh, ambition to be a low-comfort airline. 
We are an airline that will give people choices. So uh, we, we are unbundling the product, as they say, where, where you, uh, you buy a ticket and then you can add on uh, amenities, food, uh, luggage, whatever you want. Uh, so people uh, so, have to pay for all the extras as normal. You'll, it'll be a basic price. But then if you want a plane with wings, you'll pay extra. Uh, if you want a, a drink, you'll pay extra, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, the wings are included and, and, and the restrooms, <laughs> but, but uh, the, 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 the typical services you get uh, would not necessarily be, uh, be uh, free of charge in our airline, simply because, you know, many people don't need it or they don't want it, and then we don't want them to pay for it. We wanted to pay for what they actually is going to use. Our job is to ensure that all the costs are cut down so that uh, we are a great uh, choice for for those who want to sort of build the journey themselves. And when do you hope to start operating? In other words, do you think you'll be up and flying this summer? So for us, we need to see that uh, the travel restrictions have been lifted. We estimate uh, that uh, within the end of the year, uh, at least the transatlantic traffic will be open for business. Uh, and our, our main plan is that we will be fully operational with all the aircraft from uh, from, you know, about a year from now, uh, April next year. Uh, but if everything lifts up, we, we might start a soft, uh, a soft launch in, in December this year with a bit of few aircraft. A soft launch followed by a, a soft landing, hopefully, beyond Tor Larsen. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Steve. One major Asian airline said this week it expects to be flying 90% of its pre-COVID domestic capacity by the middle of the year. And that is a very rapid recovery. But that uptick in domestic demand is more than matched, sadly, by a fall in the numbers for international business travel. Despite that, airline shares are optimistic. They've surged in recent weeks on the expectation that vaccine rollouts and a gradual easing of lockdowns will boost holiday booking. So mixed pictures. But as the COVID crisis spread, corporate travel did grind to a halt. And the travel industry, worth an estimated trillion dollars in 2019, did take a massive hit. Business travel is financially crucial to the major airlines. British Airways, for example, relies on business and first-class seats for up to half its profits. While they make up only about 10% of passengers on big airlines, they do account for up to 75% of those airlines' profits worldwide. But a year of Zoom has persuaded eco-conscious bosses they should fly less. And that could spell trouble for airlines, hotels and money-spinning junkets. Spending on business travel is unlikely to jump back to what it was pre-pandemic because businesses have found other, better ways of connecting. And a big part of this was the fact that technology had become good enough substitute for much travel, with companies worldwide going virtual together. The upending of most aspects of corporate life, though, has given companies an opportunity to reconsider how they want to operate post-COVID. And many are opting to put more emphasis on fewer people traveling and climate change. And that's the early message we heard from Greece, which says it wants fewer, more cultured tourists and less mass tourism. But if that's the case, Greece and other countries reliant on holidaymakers' money will have to hope that if we do get to go abroad this year, we are really ready to spend. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda, powering the future. Is the world really ready to end its reliance on fossil fuels? But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>